Welcome to Night Coast at Nightly. I'm Jonathan Alvin, Game Master J, and this is one of our few holidays episodes. And so I wanted to wish you all the happy holidays, whatever their, your culture or philosophy is. Welcome, 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 and we are glad to have you with us. Drinking a bit of warm coffee to uh, not only warm me up, but also to wake me up a bit. And tonight we're going to be adding to a recently started series, which is more Game Master Secrets. Uh, as a Game Master with very nearly 50 years of experience, I want to share with you some of the real uh, simple tricks, techniques, things that will help your game sessions go better. So today we're going to be talking about uh, nine of them as usual, and we are going to be explaining how they work and how you can use them to improve your game playing experience and the enjoyment of your players. So the first thing we're going to talk about is something called the Keystone Rule of Eight. And this is not something that I originated, but something that I kind of instinctively glommed onto long ago and have been using constantly throughout my game's experience to help me understand and to balance the game sessions so that the players feel the danger and the threat and yet I as a game master can feel the confidence and balance in maintaining the, uh, the, the, the very feel of equality between the players and the monsters. And the fundamental basis of the rule of eight is simple statistics and it works in a 20 a D20 system or a 20 a 20 a 20 sided dice mechanism the number comes out to be 8 because of the concepts of statistical significance and um, applicability when you are looking at a combat situation where you want the players to have a somewhat of an edge you need to find a way to make their side of the numbers uh, balance out slightly better and so by utilizing an intrinsic rule of eight you accomplish this and it's a little arcane and it's also a little simplistic so i'm going to say it both ways and see how you, uh, which of them works better for you when i say the rule of eight what i am referring to is that on any given die roll with a success target of a nominal value, you should need the players to roll an eight or better for success. Now, in many systems, it's that simple, where you simply set your threshold at eight or better and that is done with it. But in role play games where they obfuscate and disguise the numeric value somewhat by putting attack modifiers on the dice rolls or providing players a bonus or a benefit upon reaching certain levels or targets in the game. The a concept of the roll of eight is simply to keep finding ways to make sure that the players are succeeding generally on eight or better out of a d20. And that comes out to mathematically about a 60% success rate. And that small measure, 10% above the pure flat average, tends to lend itself to the players succeeding it often enough to balance the situation so that they feel the threat of it because that 50-50 even shot is literally a die roll difference between success and failure. So by gauging it downward a bit so that your target is an eight for the players, then you're giving them a slight advantage in the engagement, especially if you scale the monsters so that their numbers are 10 or better. So. That small margin of error is enough to give the illusion of uh, success. Now, players that are watching this might be appalled that the numbers would be modified in the game to give them an advantage. But if you think about it, as, even as a player, it makes sort of sense to hold that premise because you want players to continue to play. And if they have a... 50 for 50 per shot of being eliminated it's you know not not worth it to the, for their effort so this keystone rule therefore becomes important because you can change that or adjust it as the fighting goes on 
to either increase or decrease the danger. So as the players are being increase, increasingly successful and they're running into different challenges, then perhaps they're getting too much of an easy t chance of it, in which case you modify the numbers upward. Whoop. Or on the opposite side, if they are having a struggle, then you certainly can adjust it downward. But generally, by keeping the numbers at a keystone of eight, then you're able to keep the game feeling equitable to the players. Second of all is maintain the mysteries in myth. In other words, when you are engaging the players, you do not have to tell them everything that the monsters can do. They, you do not have to share with them all of the elements of the uh, stuff behind the curtain, so to speak, so that if you wish to have them engage the same monster at a later time, then if you've given away the farm, so to speak, if you've told them everything that they can possibly know, then there's no mystery to it. So maintain mysteries will make it so that the players will be in, excited or interested to engage with the same monster at a later time. Now, if you think about it from another standpoint too, the idea of maintaining the mystery not only allows you to reuse a monster, it also makes the players intrigued enough to potentially hunt those monsters down in the future and find where their, where their lair is and so on. So it it enhances the story flow as well. This next one may feel a little bit odd, but LTWW is my acronym for Let the Wookie Win. Sometimes it's best to abdicate a fight. Let the let the monsters defeat your heroes, or defeat uh, let the let the heroes defeat your monsters. Um, overcome the the difficulty or whatever. Because in some, in some cases, they need a break. Sometimes players just want to continue the story and they don't want to be tied down with a bogged down fight. So um, sometimes that makes sense. But letting the Wookiee win is on a different level also uh, lets them know that you're in control of the situation so that they can begin to trust you as a storyteller more deeply so that you can then entrust them with uh, deeper lore and have them stay on task because they'll start to understand the balance between you and the team, so to speak. This idea of LTWW can be as simple as uh, the die rolling is hand waved and you just simply say they defeat the monster. It's sometimes that's all it takes. You know, if the players have challenged a villain and the villain is ill equipped, the villain is going to quit. I think one of the more powerful ones, and I've enjoyed using it quite a bit because when you answer questions with questions, you often create even more questions. So, for example, if my players uh, ask about, you know, what's going on with NPC such and such? He didn't seem himself today. Oh, he didn't? Hmm. I wonder what might be bothering him. The players are going to be intrigued. They're going to want to find out more. If they say, I noticed that the back door on the inn was open last night. Oh, was it? Hmm. I wonder what that could mean. By, by not directly answering a question, sometimes you create a more deep relationship question from the players and a more deep relationship with the story for the players, for the characters. So by not always being a bleak, I mean, not always being abrupt and don't, not always being a fact of the matter, but instead leaving some of it open to ambiguity, you give yourself and your players a chance to consider what these alternate options might represent. Pardon me. In many role-play games, I'm going to go on to the next one here. In many, many role-playing games, the structure of the game is such that it is not the armor class, it's not the weaponry, it's not the uh, health, cake, health fields that matter, but rather the action economy. How many things that the players can do 
versus how many things the villains or monsters can do. And in many of the game structures that are out there, this becomes problematic as you're doing adventures with higher level monsters. They tend to have as many attacks as the players, if not fewer. And there's generally one or two of them and the players, there's usually many. So this concept of action economy tends to therefore play into it and game masters try to find ways to uh, reduce a player's options or to say no to what players might do. And this is actually an illusion. You see in a, an engagement in a fight scene, there are more factors than just the, uh, the villains and the heroes. There are, uh, in certain cases, it might be NPCs that are not directly part of the story but become so. Or perhaps it is the environment itself becomes adversarial and the players have to use their actions to overcome the dangers of the very environment they are in. Perhaps the action economy issue can be mitigated or, or moderated by having the players be concerned with other things than just the monster, the villain. And furthermore, many of the monsters have justifications for more actions than are, war than are normally warranted. For instance, a large creature such as a dragon m might have claw claw bite attacks, but it also more and more likely have a wing beat, will more than likely have a tail swipe, will sometimes have a physical uh, push actions or simply because of their size, causing there to be more actions that the players have to interact with than just the monster's normal uh, cadre or a normal, a normal group of actions. There's going to be more to be resultant with. And by realizing that the action economy is an illusion created in many parts by the players wanting to hold the, the control of the game, it lets you as a storyteller be able to amplify the outcomes of your creatures in the game in the combat now most games have a progressive mechanism where you advance so many points for so many actions and you eventually get a level up or a boost or something and these usually are stepped and progressive but they usually also lag between, behind the action of a game. And one of the things that I found that works really good and is highly effective is the idea of providing interim merit awards. When the players do something particularly on point and specifically useful for the game, then you should provide them with a, an immediate uh, reward mechanism of some sort even if it was a symbol modifier of plus one in the next round of action or something, but give them something and let them know where it was justified from so that they will see why they want to include those parts of the game that are optimal for you as a storyteller. This idea of an interim merit award system led to what I call blessing points, and we're going to talk about that in a moment. And that is this, the power of blessing points are this. I generate the concept of a separate number of points that a player or players can earn by the actions in game that promote or advance the storyline, perhaps things that are particularly funny, clever, selfless. And these, these points then can be used not only to modify their own dice rolls, which is normal for progressive games, but also to interfere with or adjust my rules. And so by having a way to literally take back some agency or shift some luck in the game scene while they're acting, it, it makes sense. And the power of these blessing points is that I've come up with a mechanism and I'll go into more detail in an entire episode on it perhaps. But the, uh, idea of the blessing point gives the players the ability to adjust my die rolls or modify their own or add, uh, request a particular instance to occur in the game. This is all things that these points can be used for. But the main power of them is it lets the players 
recognize when you feel they're doing a good job. And there's nothing like getting people to do a good job like letting them know that they are. And this next point may seem redundant, but I, I recommend that if you haven't done so yet, consider the idea of reintroducing role-playing. And by that, I mean the players certainly build a character by a role-playing mechanism and they create the persona that they want to play in your environment and they develop the uh, persona, but they don't do much with the role of the character in game. There are mechanisms that are obvious. For example, if someone takes on the role of being a uh, cartographer, then you certainly have them do the mapping during the game sessions. That's an, an idea of role playing. A second would be, okay, they are the financier, so you make them responsible for any transactions dealing with the money. So therefore they're feeling the role in their play. And the engagement with social beings, if you are a bard or a minstrel, perhaps you should be the one doing all of the introductions and the dialogue with the monsters and such. And by reintroducing this role play, you give the players a more visceral feel for what it is to be that other person. And perhaps you can actually get them therefore to be involved in the acting process by acting in that role, not just being in charge of the administration of the die rolls and the monitoring, monitoring of the combat, but instead of the idea of, okay, we want to develop a combat strategy, so you should be in this position and you should be in that position and build up on their role as the military person in the group. All of these give the players a deeper feeling of being part of the group and a stronger feel of being part of the change that the group can represent in the game world. Finally, the last one here I want to talk about is in, enacting your version of Yosidemi. Now, I say it that way intentionally, and you may have heard this uh, presentation before, part of it, but the idea here of the Yosidemi comes back, comes from an old TV show well before most of your times, a show called Lassie. And in that show, the lead character was a little boy, well, the lead, lead, lead of the show, of course, was Lassie a collie, a dog, but the, the, the male lead, if you will, was a boy named Timmy. And all the way through the story, every episode would have Timmy involved in whatever action that Lassie was drawing in, whatever drama was being developed. But at the end of the show, the uncle would always come over and put his arm on the little boy's shoulder and say, you see, Timmy, this is what happened, and this is what it means, and this is how it should affect you. And this you see to me, as I call it, is a great way at the end of each session for your players to see how the direction you are leading them, or the direction they are traveling, is feeding into the larger story and how their actions can impact the story both positively and negatively. And by enacting some version of the you see Timmy to your game, you're going to be giving your players a way to feel the advancement and the progression that they are getting into. And these nine steps are really one of my Christmas presents to you as a game master to give your game sessions a little bit more pop and a lot more uh, consistency session over session. And I hope you keep watching. We'll be doing more of these in the future. Right now, we're going to be switching over to talking about the various campaigns during the week. And so this will be leading into the Night Coast News. Please stand by. Alrighty, so we are going to be talking about the Eastern Skies campaign, which occurs on Saturday mornings and are played on Discord. If you are interested, our Discord connection is right here on the, on the page. And I even have a way to do it over here if I remember how to do it. Uh, I don't. I don't remember. It's up here. Do, 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 do. I haven't done it but once or twice, so here we go. 
just a second and I'll share it with you. No, nope, that wasn't it. I don't remember. Anyway, it's down below, and I'll get it over there on the screen here in a minute. But check out our Discord, because that's where we play on Saturdays, and that's where this game is played. Now, in this case, the Eastern Skies campaign are, is uh, represented by the, the characters Gear, Yahara, uh, Soren, and Valkyrie. And uh, they were... Uh, ent entering into an area known as the Everburn, which is in the kingdom of Cryopathia, and that's the emblem of the region. That's how I'm identifying where they are by their uh, herald heraldic symbol. Anyway, they have entered the Everburn, and they've done so by entering a dark passage uh, deep under the ground, coming from what appeared to be a sentry post and as they went down into the passageway they went down a distance of about 90 or so feet beneath the ground and traveled along a passageway without any external light sources so they had to bring their own lights at the end of the hallway they discovered an area that was considerably larger almost like an underground hangar or warehouse and uh, utilizing some of the limited resources of Yahara, they lit up the room with incendiaries and observed that there was several, there was a large area of dark mass in the center of the city, uh, center of the structure, but that they were able to walk along the edges unobstructed. So they entered the structure and in the darkness, they happened upon several uh, corpses and beings that had been damaged by some cataclysm in the past. Ooh, that got moved a bit too much. Pardon me. That's aimed wrong again. Doggone it. Here we go. And uh, in the process, they ran into a no thank you evil in event and an encounter that was so terrifying that the group actually withdrew from the area without doing any further research. It just scared them very much. And so they, they in, terror in their terror, they escaped backwards. And in the process, they found an area known as the Arboretum. Now, with the light that they were able to uh, gain by opening the door to the uh, Arboretum, they were able to find there was a large amount of ancient combat hardware uh, what appeared to be uh, tech, uh, technomatons that were in ruin and decay from a lack of use for countless centuries but uh, once they had received their once they had achieved the arboretum they started to recover from their fear and, and, and started to feel more comfortable in the area and they were then contacted by a being from within the Arboretum that appeared almost as a wood nymph or something because it came literally out of a tree and began to profess to them their safety and security in the area. And at first they thought maybe this was some kind of a sign of a nature uh, impact that they might be able to communicate with, but soon they discovered it was actually something that itself was of a mystical nature and was associated even with Possibly the the technom technomatons that they had run into earlier, so they still haven't discovered any concepts about what the origins of the Everburn is, or even how perhaps to uh, re reduce it or put it out. But they are gaining war uh, warnings and foreshadows of what is to come. They're safe for now, but we will see what happens in the next session. Already, the next we're going to talk about are the Heralds of the Change. And this is our Sunday afternoon Patreon group. And if you are a member of our Patreon uh, uh, community, they're more, you're more than welcome to be a player in this. So if you're interested in playing on Sunday afternoons from 1 to 4, 
uh, check out patreon.com slash Nikos and join us there and thereby you'll be able to gain your access to this games group. It is again online played through our Discord. But the Heralds have uh, recently escaped from the city of Tenerife where they had been doing some uh, exploratory uh, research and had found several key items and have since withdrawn and their departure from Tenerife, they chose whether they were going to go by land, sea, or air, and they determined that land was possibly the safest. It was also the most economic because they already have steeds and equipment for over-the-road travel. So Now, as they left, they traveled eastward uh, towards the area of the Farth Fulth, and, and in particular towards the, t the village of Wormsweat. And on the process, in the process, they ran into some dragon hunters. Now, engaging with the dragon hunters, they decided that they would agree to join them at least as scouts and therefore gain some protection and an alibi if someone were to come and question, question them. Now, on, en route from there, they were engaged, uh, pursued, and then later tricked by a Starbucks who basically caused one of the players to become injured and uh, of course the Starbucks then escaped but they did learn some of the benefits of being around a Starbucks which of course we'll go into in a later point but if you want to um, learn more the easiest way of course is to become part of the group that's engaging with them but uh, shortly thereafter they captured a wounded dragonling that was in a trap and had to make the moral decision on whether or not to kill the animal because it was in pain and, and was in a, in a sorry state or whether to try to keep it alive. And they came to the ultimate decision that it should be put down. So yet after that, they decided to accompany the dragon hunters on into their way into, into, this, into the town of Warm Sweat, wherein they were introduced to a fanatic who was claiming that dragons were an evil to be destroyed and so enraged them that they basically attacked him and drove him to make a magical escape. Now, although Brace has escaped, the players are recovering from the engagement and are considering their actions, whether to continue to pursue this uh, Quantivus Brace or to return, to return to their original plans and move now northward through the Farthville. And finally, I want to bring up a third of the kingdoms, and that is the adventures in the Strangers in a Strange Land group. They are in a town, a city known as Potiphar, and it appears they may have run, had a run-in with a vampire. They're not certain, but they saw a winged beast uh, with a prognathic face right after a flash of lightning during a recent rainstorm, and they're associating that vampire with, with the other things that are going on within the town, including the kidnappings and the disappearances. Now, the kidnappings case has taken a stranger turn because the strangers in the strange land group were, were there to discover some more of the kidnappings. In this process, they realized that they could uh, possibly um, enlist the assistance of the local rogues guild, and so therefore they make, an, make a trip over to the uh, tipped tankard in the, in, in the city and work with uh, the leader of the gang who they had come to know as Jill. And Jill made them both a threat and an offer, and there's more, of course, to this story than I'm going to be putting in this moment. But the point is, is that the, the guild may or may not be interested in what the players are doing and may or may not be supporting them. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. Now, the rains on the city, which now are into their second day, have continued to vex the city officials and literally are concerning the leadership about their coming rituals as the rain has already begun, whereas their rituals were thought to be the source of the rain. But because of the fact that the rains have occurred, there are hints of involvement of the, some of the officials from the city of Red Gorge, which is down the mountain 
they have apparently some connection to sorcery and magics that might be able to assist with everything. And so we may have seen more of that in the future. Now, their associate, Kagan Gelf, has now been implicated, however, in the kidnappings as the keys to his master locks have been appropriated by the Graylings. Now, the town doesn't know any of that yet, but the group's awareness of it does put him in a bad light, suggesting that he may be involved with the Graylings and such. Because of that, they decide to go ahead and in independently make a descent into the depths by discovering a passage uh, below the cook pot in his closet. And so therefore passing into the depths below a cauldron, these people, uh, the adventurers, are seeking to find the graylings and what their connection is with the kidnappings. In the process on the way go down, they did find several mechanisms that suggest that not only are the graylings there, but are involved with the uh, undermining of the city government and so that's being led to and then finally as, as they leave that area in the in the uh, underground passages they find something known as the laughing wall and of course more of that will be carried forward in our next session and we'll bring you up to date on that as those effects happen okay as a separate section of the story today we are going to be talking about uh, one another of the veils that uh, are important to know concerning the uh, rituals and orders of the veils of Nikos. And so the one we're going to be conferring today is the one whose position I'm currently placed in. If you know much about it, you could probably do the calculation. But if you haven't by now, let's go there and see. We are talking about the Order of Nihilus. The Order of the White Veil holds Nihilus as their avatar. At, and that is the uh, avatar of purification through nothingness. The nihilists have a course that dedicates themselves to the ultimate ending of the world and the silence, peace, and purification that non-existence will represent. Nihilists prefer magical effects that negate the effects of others as well as those that are ultimately destructive or otherwise reduce or eliminate the routines and the noises of existence. Focusing on this purpose, so seemingly peaceful the surface suggests seething or at least misplaced destructive tendencies. White Veil have been even known to do effects that would cause damage to themselves in the process. As such, they are often uh, isolated and ostracized by the other members of the prismatic or rainbow orders, and often only consort with the Karelian and Purpurin brothers because of the uh, love-hate relationship they have with time and protection. Okay, now this section is again one that I, f I hold near and dear, and these are nine things that you need to know. And this is true of, I believe, every game table out there, and it may or may not be but these are some of the things that you should be able to find at any game table that you go to. You should find that the game tables you go to are a safe space. If you have issues, if you have vulnerabilities, the gamers that you play with should be the ones that are willing to help and protect you. The world is a tough place, and who, who can we trust more than those people that we enjoy uh, having engagement and company with? We should make it a safe space, if we haven't done so yet, because the world itself has enough competition and such that the people that come to your table, they should know that when they're there, they're, they're, they're good to go. They can, they can talk about anything. This next point seems a little odd, but dice rolls should be in the clear. I have for years battled with game, gamers who have a intrinsic desire to always win or always lose. They never want to have something bad happen or they never want anything good to happen, so they always fake, fake the die rolls. So if you make, it, make the policy such that all dice rolls, including your own, are made so that everybody can see them, it makes it easier for players to stay uh, within the mechanism of the rules. Don't require any dice rolls that you don't want to see. If there's a potential for something horrible to happen, 
you don't want to give it the opportunity. The next should be that your group is a, you should know that your group is a circle of trust. That is to say, things that happen in a game that set you off or trigger you or whatever should be uh, able to be communicated with the players so that they can support you and uh, assist you in whatever ways they can. Because the, the elements of a game group really should be a situation where you are in there just for the sheer enjoyment of each other's company and the sheer benefit of the game story, whatever that is. I have a heck of a time staying within my camera range here. Uh, when you are tell when you are doing role play games, the story should have gravitas. If you're telling a story and it's just whim and whimsy, that's that's fine from time to time. But generally, if you're doing a campaign or a long story arc, you should have some merit to it so that the players feel that their uh, efforts are being justified. They feel like they are accomplishing something. This ties directly to the next point, that decisions in games should matter when they are in a story that you've created and they make a decision, it should impact the world. And it's sometimes easy to, to ignore or to play through that kind of a thing. But when you do so, when you play through it, you undermine the player's feeling of value. And that really is uh, part of the the merit and purpose of being in a games group is to be a part of something and have some effect on the world. Of course, when you are in a games group, the time in your gameplay should be well spent. If all you do is fritter it away with random conversations and you don't build any camaraderie between yourselves, you're doing your doing every one of your, one of you a disservice because the merit of a good game is not only a great play experience but it should be a learning experience and it should be socially beneficial because when we um, socialize we get better at being what pe human beings are which is social beings and really the lasting effect of a good games group are rich memories the member berries as the saying goes uh, in the future are incredibly useful and enjoyable and ways that we connect and become enriched. So do what we can to create those lasting scenes in your games groups and putting the scene in scenery. It's not just a description of what you are looking at, but it should be a discussion about what you're doing together. And really the only regret in life and in your games group should be that you didn't get enough games in that the time we have together is so precious that we should spend as much of it engaging with each other at that level of joyousness and childlikeness that we gain some of that uh, temporal immortality, so to speak, that we feel the lack of the passage of time. It's also important to know that you and every other player that is out there is a teacher and a coach. And it doesn't mean not only for games, but it also means that you have the mechanisms through gameplay to teach other people about other things in life. And this is one of the real benefits of the Nikos Launchpad is that when you learn games, you're learning skills for communication. And that's really what it's all about. All right, and our last section for today is again part of the Imagination Launchpad. And this is, we've spoken earlier about the, the eliciting of a transformation protocols, such as my shaving my head as a protocol example, because it's the beginning of a protocol and a, a process of transformation. But we're now gonna be talking on the larger scale on how to stage the transformation. How do you go about putting one together? Because we all want to transform. We all want to be more and better than we are. And so this system allows us to do that. And here's basically the outline. The first thing you're going to want to do is isolate the parameters for your transformation. 
Mine in this case was a physical one. I'm changing the way I look by changing up my hairstyle. I'm changing up, if you hadn't noticed, there's been a slight change in my uh, clothing and apparel. I'm going to be improving that over the next few months. I'm getting more into physical activity again. I've broken out my roller skates and things like that. These are all examples of parameters that are being put into place for my transformation. So for you, pardon me, and your transformation, you're going to want to isolate the parameters. What is it you want to change? What is it you want to see transformed? What are you going to be giving up? You have to consider virtually all of the variables. Now, you can't, of course, possibly comprehend all the variables in the universe, but you want to consider the ones that you have a hand in, that you, you can actually touch and change. Uh, you want to develop a, st a strategic timeline, and by that I mean not only what's going to happen, but when in order things should fall. What, what, which ones are going to have a higher priority than the others? Which ones are going to be more directly impacting the change itself? And how many of them are the support steps? Now, in the case of many of the support steps, you want to take as many preparatory steps as you can. Before I started changing my protocols for my appearance, I had already got the new wheels for my roller skates and I got the material for um, softening the leather and things like that because brand new skates will tear your legs up like nobody's business. Uh, but you want to make sure you do those preparatory steps in advance of the uh, protocol trigger, such as my haircut, so that when you make the commitment, it becomes an action. So in this case, the commitment action was shaving my head. So now that I've made that commitment action, now I can start to progress on all the other smaller victories. And as I do so, I'm going to reward myself as we go along. I'm going to be adding new features to my show. I'm going to be, as we build our audience, I'm going to be adding new benefits for you, the viewers. I want to encourage, increase my visual presence. I want to increase my audio quality. I want to improve my lighting. There's all these things that I want to be able to do to support what I'm doing for you. And I'm going to reward myself and the small actions that I make, the small victories that I attain in order to justify those expansions. Now, of course, when you build your plan, you're going to want to allow for adaptation because sometimes the things you plan, things you intend, change. And as they change and alter, you need to be able to make ad adaptations to your plan. But notice this also means you need to reset a temporal agenda. You need to say, this transaction, this transformation will have an end time. I will have accomplished the transformation by a point. And by setting a temporal agenda like that, you give your mind permission to adapt and change things on the way so that the accomplishments can occur within that time frame. Some things will have to be accelerated. Some things will have to be adjusted. And the whole point is that a, temp a transformation is a permanent change brought on by temporary actions and even temporal actions. You do things by a certain point. Now, all of this comes down to the actual process of transformation. And the transformation process is plan, act, record, assess. You want to plan what you're going to be doing to change. You're going to make the action. You're going to record for yourself in some fashion how that progress has occurred and then assess the results in comparison with the agenda and then make adjustments. This will lead, therefore, to a new pattern. And the trick is then once you've established the new pattern, then you repeat the new pattern until it becomes routine. And ultimately, when you reach the end of your temporal agenda, time is up to end analyze. Did we make the transformation? Was it full? Was it partial? Was it a wild success? Where were we on it? And once you've done that, now you've analyzed it, you can now look at whether or not an additional transformation along the same line needs to happen or whether you can change and choose another process in your life to transform. So ultimately, it comes down to this. You need to follow one course until successful, but that one course 
still can have its trajectory changed. And so the point is, is to follow your one course until successful and adjust your course as necessary to achieve that final objective. And in this case, the final objective is an amazing life and an amazing uh, games experience in everything that I do. So I want to thank you for being here tonight. Um, I'm going to be closing out the show in just a few minutes. We made it um, 45 minutes. So we're getting closer to the hour objective, which is another one of our transformational objectives. But here's the list of the shortcuts. If you're looking for information on the Nikos RPG itself, check out nikosrpg.com for product info and to make purchases. If you're looking for information on the Nikos uh, game world, you'll want to check out nikosrpg.info for story, lore, and so much more. Our Discord is linked down below, and you can join us there basically at any time, and we greatly appreciate you being there for our games on Saturdays and Sundays. And for more stories and info, check out both the other videos on twitch.tv slash nikosrpg and our YouTube channel at nikosrpg. Until then, we want to thank you guys for all for being here, and thank you in particular to our pat Patreon supporters who help keep us uh, on the air. Check that out at patreon.com slash join slash Nikos, and I hope to see you all in the next episode. This is John Alban, uh, Game Master J, and we'll see you next time.